Good evening uh, and welcome to the New York Symposium with Diane Sayre. This is the last symposium in the year 2022. And obviously, I think all of humanity hopes that 2023 will bring us a great reversal in direction in many, many ways. We just heard um, from Johann Sebastian Bach from the St. John Passion, Ich folge dir gleichfalls. I follow you likewise with happy steps, uh, speaking to Christ. Uh, and this has everything to do with what we're going to be talking about this evening, which is Bach and Kepler, two minds that were very precious to civilization and particularly to. Lyndon LaRouche, uh, one of the greatest minds that humanity has yet produced. And I just pulled up a paper which I would encourage uh, people dig up. It's by LaRouche called Music and Statecraft, How Space is Organized. And it was written uh, in 2007. And he speaks of uh, the question of organizing space, Kepler, how he was able in his mind to come up with a viable hypothesis for the ordering principle of our solar system. Yes, there were observations, but in the observations, there were some tricks because people presumed that orbits were circular, uh, there were other kinds of presumptions, what you might call curve fitting, or people have the expression close enough for jazz, <laughs> where things were made to fit into an assumption as opposed to recognizing that these little uh, teeny bits of an angle where something might be off actually was intentional and deliberate and demonstrated the ordering principle of the universe of physical space time. Uh, and this has everything to do with the music harmonic principles, which you might consider most clear to our sense of hearing, but also proportions that are detectable with our sense of vision. And then is there a contradiction between what you hear and what you see? And what does that tell you? Now, what LaRouche says in this, um, which I'd like you to just consider before we go on, uh, he writes, all of the preceding reflections on music here are most relevant to that discussion of the universality for classical and art and science of this idea of space in this present location. All truly great classical composition is implicitly organized around an underlying conception of the deep and actually implicitly deeply Riemannian psychological organization of musical space time, as exemplified by Furtwängler's conducting as between the notes. This point of view requires us to see the performance of the notes as subordinated, that according to the unifying principle of Pythagorean, Platonic, Leibnizian, and Riemannian physical dynamis 
or dynamis, dynamics as truly great musical composers such as Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven do. All among that which each among these great composers have created has been in fact a great moral act, the crafting of a mental image of an expanse which came to be known to us as the quality and in the form of a Riemannian physical space-time, within which space the exploration and development of that so defined domain proceeds with successful climbers in bringing science toward that, toward what is acceptable as a pinnacle, because it is the expression of a most gratifying sense of the inherent completeness, the integrity of that development. Now, what does this have to do with politics? What does this have to do with music, with science? Hopefully by the end of our discussion this evening, you'll have a better sense of that. But one thing it has to do with is the question of truth. Um, will the universe tolerate behavior which violates certain universal and physical principles? I find it very interesting that LaRouche included psychological space time, not just physical space time what does that mean does the human mind reflect certain universal principles socrates certainly believed so and um i think it's irrefutable when you consider why classical music moves people universally even a symphony which has no words what is the language why do people recognize something as beautiful a symphony by beethoven performed well under a qualified conductor. Uh, so this is important because if you look at what's happening right now in the world, the very great danger of a thermonuclear showdown between NATO and Russia, the US, the UK, NATO and Russia, where there seems to be no limit to the depravity and insanity of the Western alliance, including uh, what has been brought up recently, where on December 9th, President Putin said that Russia may have to change their no first use doctrine because President Biden is talking about a um, preemptive strike to destroy the ability to respond. In other words, a disarming strike. And Putin said, well, if you're talking about that, that means we wouldn't have a second strike. So we would have to use a first strike if we wanted to ensure that we were not going to be hit, if we wanted to deter that. Um, if you look at what's happening with now, I think, three different attacks on Russian military bases, some as far as 900 kilometers into Russia, away from the Kiev-controlled parts of Ukraine, Clearly, the purpose of that would be to test Russia's defense capability. In other words, to prepare for such a strike. If this doesn't have your hair standing on end, wondering what can be the result of such a policy, then you're not in reality. That is why Helga Zepp LaRouche uh, seized upon the initiative by Pope Francis and the Vatican to offer to hold peace talks um, between Russia and Ukraine with no preconditions. Now, everyone should know that Ukraine isn't going to enter any peace talks unless the United States changes. And we will say something about that later because I'm having a, a special symposium on January 8th. Uh, so we are definitely in an extremely dangerous situation but I hope tonight after you hear the presentations, you will feel more hopeful about the uh, situation because you will see that the universe is indeed ordered. Now, just two things I wanted to share, a tale of two cities, we'll put it that way. Um, in Ukraine, they have basically banned the performance of Tchaikovsky, even though he was Ukrainian, uh, because he's also seen as a hero of Russia and Russian culture and Russian 
composition. And the National Music Academy in Kiev is named after him. It's named the Tchaikovsky National Music Academy of Ukraine. So the Minister of Culture of Ukraine has been trying to force them to take Tchaikovsky's name off of this academy. And I'm happy to say the director of the academy has resisted and refused in spite of this pressure from a uh, very nasty regime, which is known to assassinate and eliminate people as the Nazis did. Uh, and what uh, the uh, one of the members of the Academy Supervisory Board had said, quote, Tchaikovsky, like Shakespeare, like Joan of Arc, like Christ, doesn't belong to one specific people. He belongs to the whole world. He also added that it's ironic because Tchaikovsky on both sides of his family actually wasn't Russian. His mother was French and his father was from a Cossack family from Zaporozhia, uh, the Zaporozhia region of Ukraine. But you see, I think if you want to have a totalitarian regime, you have to destroy beauty. Now, the other city is Odessa, where they are now removing the monument, just as the Bolsheviks did, to of Catherine the Great, who was the founder of the city and who, by the way, was a very important ally of the American Revolution. Uh, the last time the statue was removed, as I said, was in 1920 by the Bolsheviks, and they wanted to replace it with some American porn star that I never heard of named Billy Harrington. So really disgusting, but it gives you a sense. If you want people to be ugly and bestial, destroy the culture. And you can see there's still a fight for that there. Can we get a fight for that in the United States? Now, I was going to start with Fred Haidt on Bach, but he has disappeared and I don't know if he's gotten back. Is he back, Jose? All right, so we lost Fred. So I think in that case, we are going to go ahead with my colleague, Roger Ham. Oh, there's Fred. Now I see they say he's here. Let me see if he's ready. Oops, there he is. Fred, are you ready? I was about to start with Roger because you weren't here. Well, Roger, why don't you go ahead since Fred is having trouble unmuting and we'll go to Fred second. Okay. Well, I wanna wish everybody a happy new years. And I want to share with all of you a gift from 411 years ago, um, which was made by the German astronomer, Johannes Kepler. Uh, as a New Year's gift to his patron and benefactor, John Matthew Wacker of Wackenfels, who was a counselor to Rudolf I, the Holy Roman Emperor uh, based in Prague at the time. And what Kepler does is he answers the age old question, what do you give the man who has everything? And he concludes that the only thing you can give him is nothing. And then he proceeds to define exactly what it is that would be nothing. And he goes through the ancient four elements of air, fire, wind, and water, and basically shows why, you know, dust would be giving him too much. Um, and that fire is simply the the ash from a burning ember, and that's uh, similar to dust, and that, that would be too much. So he goes through all of these, and he discusses how in water, you can have a tiny droplet, a, a dismissed little droplet of wine on the fingernail of the person who had already drained his cup, and that perhaps there would be something here that would be fitting for someone who so delights in nothing. 
And so he then proceeds to decide what would really constitute nothing. And he says, by, a, by, a, by chance, at the time that he was turning this over in his mind, he was walking across the Charles Bridge in Prague and snowflakes began to fall on his shoulder. And he tries to look very closely at the snowflakes and notice that all of them seem to have six, six arms projecting out from the center. And uh, Jose, you might want to put on some of the images here um, of Kepler. Um, I want to thank Jose and Suzanne for helping me with some of the graphics for this presentation. I'm visiting relatives in upstate New York um, at the moment, so um, I don't have access to some of the things I would like to use for a presentation. Um, but can you put up a picture of Kepler? Yeah, this is Kepler. You see the, the years when he lived. Um, in 1611, when this New Year's Eve gis, gift was published, he was 40 years old. And um, if you go to the next slide, he was the imperial mathematician to uh, the Holy Roman Emperor at, uh, in 1611 when he wrote this short paper. It's only 14 pages. I highly recommend that everybody um, find it and read it for themselves. Um, so can you put up the next picture? This is a copy of the original uh, paper on the six-sided snowflake. The next picture, please. This is a modern translation um, which has been published. The next one. These are some actual photographs uh, that of snowflakes, which was taken by a, a farmer, a um, guy named Wilson Bentley, who was just excited to study the tremendous richness and complexity of snowflakes. And you can see in all of these, there are many, many other types that in spite of the enormous variety, they all have this basic structure of having six sides or, or six points. And so Kepler immediately asked the question, well, why? What could it possibly be? Water begins as vapor, which presumably has no shape or perhaps a spherical shape like a droplet, and yet somehow it takes on this specific shape. Uh, the next picture, please. Now, for people who are at all familiar with Kepler, when he was a, a, a much younger man, he was actually 24, when he published a book, The Mysterium Cosmographicum, where he attempts to explain why the entire solar system is in the proportions that we find it. Why is the distance of Saturn twice that of Jupiter? And what, what are the relationships between the planetary orbits? And one of the fundamental tools that he uses it's, it's sort of a technology for investigating the physical world is geometry. And he takes, these are the so-called five platonic solids, which had been known since the time of the Greeks. These are the only figures in three-dimensional space that can be formed out of uh, regular uh, polygons, where every one of the faces is identical and every one of the faces has equal length sides and equal internal angles. And these are all composed either of equilateral triangles, squares, or pentagons. Those are the only shapes that um, can be used to form these regular figures. And if you go to the next picture, 
This is from his book, The Mysterium Cosmographicum, where he shows that there is a way to nest these five platonic solids to give at least a very close approximation of the ratio of the, uh, the diameters of all of the known planets at that time of the diameters of each of their orbits. So he's already done very extensive investigations of geometry and proportion and says that this has to be a fundamental component of how the creator built the universe. And so he immediately takes up the question of how can we apply these kind of tools to investigate something as uh, intricate and which has such great potential, but yet comes out of mere water vapor, the snowflake. So if you'll take the next picture. And he says, well, I'm going to take a little digression to try to study this question from, from another angle, something that we may be more familiar from. And that's the honeycomb, which is formed by bees. And as you can see, each of these cells where the honey can be stored or where larvae, uh, where eggs could be laid and larvae could be developed are in the shape of a hexagon. They have six sides. The next picture, please. And this is a picture taken up, uh, uh, from above. And on the left, you can see cells which have a larva inside them. And in the ones on the right, which simply have, I guess, uh, those are the, the eggs in the bottom, that you can see that the bottom of each cell seems to be formed from three uh, you know, three planes that come together at a point. And if you can, if you can put me on the picture, I want to show you, this is an actual honeycomb uh, that I have. And if you look, if I can get this up here, uh, I don't know if that will, if that will focus properly. Yeah. Again, you can see within the hexagons, there seems to be three lines that come together in the center. And that what that shape actually is, is what's called a rhombic dodecahedron. And I think we have, we have a picture of one of those coming up. If you can go to one of the, the next pictures. Well, that's a regular, well, that, okay. That's a regular hexagon. It looks a little bit stretched out on the screen, um, but that's, that's the shape that the opening of each of the honeycombs has. And the next one. This shows that the each of the, the tubes or cells of the honeycomb, there are actually two rows that come together. And at the, the point where they come together, that's where you get these three flat surfaces, which join the two. And so Kepler goes into great discussion of uh, why this shape would be the best for the honeybee for uh, the, the rearing of the young, avoiding cold drafts from coming in through gaps in the cells, because the hexagon shape is one of only three regular shapes that can fill a, a surface. You know, if you had uh, bathroom tiles, you wanted to cover your bathroom floor without having a gap, the only regular shapes that that will work for are triangles, squares, and hexagons. So there's no gaps in between. Uh, there would be no draft that would be allowed to come in. And if you go to the next picture, I think we have a picture. 
of this rhombic dodecahedron. It has 12 faces. Each face is sort of a, 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 a rectangle that's been tilted over to the side a bit. So they don't have right angles at the corners. They're called a rhombus. And if the, if the honeybee cell were closed, it would have this shape, but because you need to, you know, the bee has to be able to get in and out, it's open, but this is the fundamental shape that the honeybees actually build. And that raises a lot of questions because how would the honeybees know the kind of geometry um, that the Greek geometers and, and Kepler had studied for, uh, for so many years. But the point I, I, I just make about this is that Kepler is very playfully asking these questions about what principles would order the, the, the space in which we live and that everything in one way or another has to be organized by those principles. So whether the, the honeybee knows much about geometry, it's going to take advantage of certain characteristics of these shapes which uh, do the best job for what it is trying to achieve. And I would, um, well, let's just go on to the next picture. Um, okay, now, then he jumps to the question of pomegranates. You say, well, okay, well, what do pomegranates have to, have to do with either snowflakes or honeybees? And he says, well, again, there are certain physical principles which are going to result in certain ways of organizing space. Now, if you've ever eaten a pomegranate, there are seeds there are hundreds of seeds, each of which is encased by this fleshy fruit inside. Now the seeds aren't quite spherical, but he, he suggests that each of these little fruity, fleshy pods inside the fruit would begin as a sphere, but the rind of the pomegranate is actually quite tough. So as the pomegranate grew, there would be a lot of pressure from the rind um, exerted on all of these little seeds inside the pomegranate. Now, if you'll take down the picture for a minute and put me up. Okay, well, that's just another picture of a pomegranate, pomegranate fruit. Okay, here we go. Now I'm going to try an experiment live for you, um, unrehearsed for many years, but what I've done is to make a whole bunch of little round balls out of modeling clay. And they're all as round as I can manage to make them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this big wad of, of of clay balls in my hand, and I'm going to try to squeeze them much like the rind of a pomegranate would squeeze all those little fruits inside the pomegranate. And we're gonna see what happens. So I'm just trying to squeeze it as uniformly as I can from all directions. And I get this this blob. And now I'm going to take it apart and we're going to see what happened to those little round balls that we started with. And I don't know how well you'll be able to see this. I'll dig out some from the, from the center which hopefully got the most uniform force applied to them. And I don't know if you can see this, but there are flat faces 
that have been created on this little ball of clay. And I had done this a few years ago. And maybe, I don't know if it's gonna be clearer on any of these, but you get sharp, there's a beautiful, that, that dark face there, that is a rhombus. It's like a rectangle that sort of got pushed on its side. And ideally, this would form 12 sides, would form a rhombic dodecahedron, exactly the shape that is the uh, construction principle that we saw in the honeycomb. So whenever I read this paper, I have an overwhelming urge to run out and buy modeling clay, to buy a large number of marbles, and to go to the grocery store and buy lots of fruits and vegetables. Because I'm sure everyone knows that apples have seeds, but do you know how the seeds are arranged inside the apple? And there have been a number of books written on this idea, idea of geometry and nature, how certain of these principles are expressed, frankly, everywhere that you do look, but you have to look. And one of the things that I would say about uh, Kepler and the, object and the objective that he took in writing this was in a very playful way, he's, he's constantly trying to make jokes about all of this and how he's constantly struggling to really make sure that he's giving his benefactor nothing, is that it's really a treatise on education because one of the reasons that Mr. LaRouche and the, the Schiller Institute have put such emphasis on Kepler um, is that one of the most important aspects of education is don't tell people the answer, let them discover it for themselves. Don't tell them that some genius discovered uh, some principle and then state the principle so that somebody can memorize it or look it up on Wikipedia and think they know what they're talking about. They need to experience the act of discovery for themselves. And Kepler is one of those scientists who is extremely open about the thought process that he goes through in order to make the discoveries that he did. And the Snowflake paper is a beautiful short example of doing exactly that. Um, and you know, the, the, the other big mistake would be to tell some child when they ask why, 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 is either because I say so or because it works. That doesn't really teach you anything. And that um, this is why we've considered the study of Kepler to be an, an, important, uh, uh, an important part of anyone's attempt to understand how to think how to determine what is true as opposed to accepting this opinion, that opinion, choosing the news commentator that ha happens to repeat your existing prejudices, but how can you actually develop the tools to be able to determine what must be true, what's, what you're not being told, what, you, what questions you need to ask. So he's, he's discussed honeycombs, he's dis discussed pomegranates, and then he has sort of one other major category, which I guess you could call stacking cannonballs. Because again, he says, well, getting back to the question of snowflakes, if you have these vapors, which have no particular form, um, how might they condense in order to create this six-sided symmetry that we've seen? And so to do that, he starts to say, well, okay, well, what if you took round solid objects like cannonballs or marbles in my case, they're a little easier to work with. 
is how can you pack them together? And I'll just give you, I don't know, this may fall apart. These are, these are somewhat old that if you have, if you see the one marble in the center, you can put exactly six marbles around it that all touch each other. And that's the greatest number of, of marbles that you can, identical marbles that you can put around any one marble um, to touch it. And if you put marbles on top of that marble and underneath that marble, you can create arrangements which form, drum roll, you can create this figure where I've just put colored paper over the marbles underneath to show you the, the way that they're arranged. You can see there are four marbles in a square there, and here there are three in a triangle. This is called a cube octahedron, which is considered the dual, sort of the opposite of the rhombic dodecahedron we've just been talking about, where if you took every corner and made it the center of a face and took every face and made the center of it a corner, that you could produce the, the, the dual figure. It's sort of a, 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 a twin. And so then he goes through all these examples of how you could, how you could stack cannonballs, how you can fill a plane surface, how you can fill three-dimensional space with regular figures. And all of this to try to explain why the heck does a snowflake have six, six corners? And he can never ultimately uh, answer that question. But in the course of it, he's given you a whole series of tools to investigate not only snowflakes, but many other things. And most importantly, hopefully has triggered your own inquisitiveness that I want to understand this. And that's why I say, I really urge you to go buy marbles, go buy modeling clay, go slice up, you know, cucumbers and apples and anything else you can lay your hands on and start asking exactly those kind of questions. Um, so I think I will leave it at that. And, um, you know, if we have time for questions later, have fun. Great. Thank you very much. I hope in the questions we can go back and look at the um, look at the snowflakes again. Uh, they were so beautiful. Uh, so now we're going to go to Fred Haight, who has, is going to share something with us about Johann Sebastian Bach. Thanks, Diane. The Kepler wrote in the Harmonies of the World that it might take a hundred years for a composer to come along who could actually comprehend what he had done and act upon it. That happened. Kepler published the Harmonies of the World in 1618, and Bach uh, presented his famous well-tempered clavier in 1722. Let us start by comparing two settings of the same piece by men born a hundred years apart. The text is Magnificat Anima Mei Dominum, My Soul Magnifies the Lord. It is the words of the Virgin Mary when she discovers that she is pregnant with the Son of God. It is a magnificent idea, and the composer has to magnify that idea through his or her own soul. Heinrich Schutz was a somewhat younger contemporary of Kepler, born in 1585, exactly 100 years before Bach. Here is his setting of just those few words.
If Schutz, who was a great composer in his own time, has magnified his own soul at perhaps the level of a backyard telescope, then Bach, as enabled by Kepler, is approaching the James Webb. On just the first word, Magnificat. Though Bach learned from a lot of people, I do not believe that he would have been possible without Kepler. For those who might be upset with his religious terminology, let me pose a great paradox. For Kepler, there was no difference between science and religion. Ideas that he stated in theological terms are rock-solid principles of the physical universe. In a paper called Economics, at the end of a delusion, Lyndon LaRouche wrote, Kepler was the founder of the first successful effort to establish a comprehensive form of mathematical physics, the first to establish a method which freed science from the ivory tower mathematician's blackboard, and to civilize mathematics by bringing it into the real world, the world of universal physical principles rather than the purely imaginary world of abstract ivory tower mathematical speculations. Kepler's scientific contributions to astronomy are recognized, they're not disputed, but his contributions to music are often regarded as mystical. The former statement from Mr. LaRouche could apply equally to his work in astronomy or in music. He took the same methodological approach to both and accomplished the same revolution in both. How many people have done that? Make a revolution in both science and art. Humanity has often been set back for thousands of years by politically imposed false axiomatic assumptions. For example, Aristarchus of Samos knew in the third century BC that the sun was at the center of the solar system, not the earth. He had fairly accurate measurements of the distance between the sun, the moon, and the earth. Later, Ptolemy, with no scientific reason whatsoever, reinstated Aristotle's idea that the earth had to be at the center of the solar system. If you accept the politically imposed axiomatic assumptions that the Earth is at the center of the solar system and that the planets must obey perfectly circular orbits, you will never construct an accurate image of the universe. Ptolemy may have taken uh, meticulous observations, but in order to fit those observations to the theory, he required the planets to become circus acrobats and perform loop-de-loops known as epicycles. Imagine trying to land on the moon with this model. Kepler's method led him to discover the elliptical orbits of the planets, and in fact it's in these elliptical orbits that he found the musical ratios he would have never found the music in the heavens without his own revolutionary discovery. 
with Kepler for the first time, the mathematical conceptual model of the orbits of the planets and the actual physical orbits of the planets are not two different things. They are a one. And that's what Mr. LaRouche was talking about. The situation in music was similar. A couple of false axioms held sway there. One was that there was a music of the spheres, a divine music, and earthly music, but they were completely different, and that the music of the heavens was unknowable for man. So we were stuck with music that was mundane. The other was that mathematical ratios were the cause of musical harmonies. Supposedly Pythagoras, and I'm not convinced there's necessarily any truth to this at all, used an instrument called the monochord to divide a string into different proportions and that those proportions yielded the ratios of the musical intervals. For example, dividing the string in half gave us the octave with a ratio of 2 over 1. Uh, dividing it into thirds gave us the ratio for the two-thirds part that was sounding uh, of 3 over 2 for the fifth, etc. It's very appealing. It's an ordered sequence, and uh, the string does divide up in that way. But strings are abiotic, non-living, and as such, they come close to the real values, but they are distorted, or as seen through a glass darkly, and distorted enough that they can never be in tune from the standpoint of the musical system as a whole. The real values, which are not necessarily uh, numerical or fixed, will have to come from the higher levels of the biosphere and the noosphere, life and the mind, which we find in human bel canto singing, which is what Lyndon LaRouche has always insisted upon. The problem is, is that the values of the intervals as determined by mathematics as fractions, rational numbers, was an axiomatic assumption that held uh, sway uh, every bit as much as the axiomatic assumptions that the orbits of the planets were perfect circles. You were not allowed to move beyond that. Kepler recognized this and took it head on, though his discovery of the musical intervals in the solar system in Book 5 is what he is famous for. Book 3 is extremely important. He opens it by saying, The causes of the intervals have remained unknown to man, so much so that before Pythagoras they were not even sought, and after that they have been sought for 2,000 years. In the course of those 2,000 years, the opinion has been reached that the causes are to be looked for in the properties of the proportions themselves, as they are contained within the boundaries of a discrete quantity, that is to say, of numbers. I shall be the first, unless I am mistaken, to reveal them, the true causes. He continues, If God had chosen numbers as his archetype, it would still not be clear why 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 conform to musical intervals, and 7, 11, and 13 do not. Since the terms of the consonant intervals are continuous quantities, the causes which set them apart from the discords must also be sought for among the family of continuous quantities, not among abstract numbers, that is, in discrete numbers, since it is mind which shaped human intellects in such a way that they would delight in such an interval. All souls spirits and minds are in the image of God. Therefore, they rejoice in the proportions he had used and use the same in their own functions. 
It is the mind which discriminates consonant proportions from dissonant. Proportions are perceptible by reason alone, not by sense. To distinguish proportion as form from that which is proportioned as matter is the work of mind. Kepler was critical of those who uh, determined all musical harmony from numbers. They really believed that if there was not harmony in numbers, there was no harmony in music. The harmony in music came from the numbers, and they didn't even trust their own ears and hearing, by which Kepler means not some mechanistic notion of hearing, but the mind's ability to judge what it's hearing. He continues, The Pythagoreans were so much given over to this method of philosophizing by numbers that they did not even stand by the judgment of their ears. They marked out what was melodic and unmelodic, and what was consonant and what was dissonant from their numbers alone, doing violence to the natural prompting of hearing. When the theorist came up with harmonies that looked good on paper in numbers but sounded awful, he responded, it is possible for strings to be tuned that way, since they are inanimate and do not impose their own judgment. But follow the hand of the foolish theorist without the least resistance. But let us hear the problem. In a well-tempered system, I should be able to play a tune in one key. Then transpose it to another and have it still be in tune. If I try to preserve the so called pure natural numbers, though, it will not be in tune when I transpose it to a distant key. Kepler today more than ever, in a time in which false axiomatic assumptions, such as the idea that man is the most dangerous animal and that man's industrial efforts are destroying the planet through climate change, etc., etc., we need Kepler, who demonstrated the goodness of the universe we live in, the goodness of its creator, and the goodness that rests within each of our own souls and the coherence and unity of those goodnesses. Maybe you could explain what you were getting at with these intervals and what that has to do with uh, what Kepler was saying. Okay, well, I like to compare it to the planetary motions actually because <clears throat> if you accept the idea that the planets move in perfect circles, then you make these observations, but in order to match that to some kind of motion, the planets are completely out of tune. They're doing what are called epicycles. They're actually moving in a circle and then forming circles as they go around the circle, because you're starting with a false conception of the notion of an orbit, and then you're trying to construct an entire system out of that. What happens with the intervals is that they measure uh, these intervals on a monochord, which is, first of all, it's non-living. It's abiotic in the sense that Vernadsky would identify. You don't get the true intervals from something that's dead, like wood and strings. And the ratios uh, appealed to people because they said, well, this is pure. This is three over two. This is four over three. How can you get better than that? But they actually do not correspond to that. So when you take a three over two as the ratio of the fifth, it's a little too big. It's a little too big. I mean, if you go around, Pythagoras tried this, you go around the circle of fifths with 12 fifths starting at C, you should end up at a higher octave of C. You do not. You end up sharp of that. 
because that ratio of three to two is uh, too large. So you have to start with the entire system as a whole and derive the, individ the individual intervals from that rather than starting with the full definition of the intervals and trying to build up a system from that. And this set music back for centuries, Diana. There's some very great Renaissance music written, but they can't really move from one key to another very easily because of the problem that you heard with that piano. It goes out of tune. Right. Roger, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, I mean, that's... One of the really wonderful things about Kepler is the way that he he draws from different areas uh, to try to understand the lawfulness of the universe, that it, it must be lawful. And if it doesn't appear so, there must be something wrong with the way that we're looking at it. And as I had said before, well, there has, has been tremendous advancements in our knowledge about planetary motions and uh, music and other things. The, one of the really critical things about Kepler is he is one of the most open people about showing you exactly how he thinks. When you go through, just like in the snowflake paper, he'll, he'll, he'll put forward ideas that he later in the same paper, you know, five pages later, he says, oh, well, that was stupid. You know, that's not true. He thinks, well, maybe, maybe the snowflakes, these six things are bars that come at right angles to each other. And when it lands, then it falls flat. And that's why we see them all as flat flakes. And later on, he says, well, that was, that was a stupid idea. That's, that's clearly not, you know, why they form this way. And it's because of the clarity of his thought processes that you can sort of uh, re recreate in your own mind the thinking that he went through to make a fundamental breakthrough. And that that more than anything in terms of education is what you want a young person to re-experience in their own journey to become a creative person, not some sort of you know, compendium of facts. So uh, that's, that's what I always love about the study of Kepler. And I've always been fascinated by how you, how you got from these insights that Kepler had to the music of someone like Bach. And I think there's a lot more, there's a lot more there that we all need to, to learn about. Also, I will just say on this question, um, which I think further confirms that it's innate. Um, your your mind, as and I love that Kepler said that these relationships are in your mind. That is, if it weren't for mind, they wouldn't exist. It it wouldn't it would be irrelevant. So, this idea of man created in the image of the creator and the universe being created. Um, nothing is arbitrary and there's a certain delight in the beauty of it. And then the kind of what you might call imperfections. Um, when I was young, I was really obsessed, for example, with figuring out a way to flatten pi, to make it come out to a rational number. And I ended up doing what Archimedes did actually, trying to, and I insisted that if you could just get to infinity, it would all work out. <laughs> Um, and then what you realize by Kepler's work is that actually it's these little discontinuities, discontinuities where things don't quite line up where the discovery is because you have to actually get to a new dimension. There's some perspective from which you are not actually seeing or, or understanding, I should say, the the reality of it and in the music um you your mind hears that as you might call it a key change right a note is introduced which seems to be dissonant or unstable seems not to be in the key and then the music develops and you almost hear in reverse 
the lawfulness of that challenge to the the order um and also the question of tuning because i know that actually a good string player a singer pianists don't have the opportunity to do this because their instrument is fixed but depending on the relationship of the intervals you actually slightly change the tuning depending on which way you're going and depending on what the other voices are doing so does that mean it's not perfect that's a really paradoxical question i think yeah right. yeah i agree with you diane uh I, for a long time now i thought that people think of temperament too much as a set of fixed ratios and it's actually a human process that has to be going on all the time and in terms of what you said at strings uh one of the best examples of it was pablo casals because he would tell his students uh on the cello who were playing along with the piano he said if they played in perfect equal temperament he said you've been brainwashed by the piano and then he would demonstrate uh certain things he would demonstrate how close a half tone could come together he would actually do a a turn on the cello where you had a note a half note above and then a half note below and the faster he did it the more his fingers actually drew together so the distance between these notes actually changed and uh, though he may not have referred to it as temporary as he went along i think that's actually what it is and uh, singers do that too yes someone's writing in the chat a singer a tenor talking about working on just intonation and consciously but i'm not sure that it comes out exactly as just intonation because part of it is that it's not perfect intervals um at any rate uh this will be once we create more generations of geniuses there's going to be a lot more work on this i think if we can survive the coming period um so i just uh i want to thank both of you i jose can you just please put that picture of the snowflakes up again i just thought that was so lovely and this is the time of year to go out and try to find some of your own so yeah and i challenge everyone to figure out how to take a picture of them without melting them the the snowflakes the beautiful picture of those snowflakes yes yes Can you spotlight it? Can everyone see that? Oh, no. There we go. There we go. Because, and Leibniz speaks about this. It's a case of human beings. It's amazing because there are certain, obviously, universal, the six points. Um, and every single one of them is totally unique. That is just one of the most amazing miracles. We have 8 billion people on the planet. Everyone and each one is completely unique, um, even though there are many things about the human form which are universal. Um, so I, I would challenge people over the snowy season, if you get any, see if you can get some pictures of some good ones or you can spend time trying to find two that are identical <laughs> there's a challenge anyone who can find two identical snowflakes uh we'll work on that one okay you can end the screen sharing there'll be a big prize <laughs> i can guarantee a billion dollars for anyone who finds two identical snowflakes <laughs> <laughs> it won't happen now uh let me just close um by telling people that on january 8th from two to four sunday january 8th i'm holding a policy discussion and i would really urge everyone to participate it's going to be a zoom webinar it will not be live streamed on youtube or facebook because some of what we are 
going to discuss probably um, will will not be allowed. Uh, but I, as I said, the question is, can nuclear war be avoided? And in the invitation I write, the answer to that question is yes, but only if the United States becomes a trustworthy partner. Uh, and I will be joined by uh, Colonel Black, a former state senator from Virginia, Scott Ritter, um, the former UN weapons inspector, Helga Zeppelarouche, and this is not, and Stephen Starr, who is an expert on the destructive capability of nuclear weapons. Uh, this is not for the purpose of endorsing my campaign, but as I say in the invitation, if our Congress were half rational, these people would be brought in for emergency hearings so we could get our nation off of the trajectory toward a nuclear confrontation. And what I am looking at is this question of how can the United States become trustworthy? And we can't unless we address some of the things that have happened internally, for example, the Kennedy assassination which as people know, Biden once again refused to release 5,000 pages of documents on the Kennedy assassination. For what reason? There was a court order in 1992 that 25 years later, these files could be released. In 2017, we know Mike Pompeo, the man who uh, taught people to lie, cheat, and steal and at the CIA, who said there were whole courses in this, um, and who has continued that policy, blocked it. Now we have Biden blocking it. And one reason why the world might not trust us is if we don't care enough to figure out how a president of our nation and a potential president, his younger brother, and leaders like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X could be assassinated, and what intelligence agencies inside the United States would have been involved in doing that and covering up for it, then obviously we are not a reliable partner because what's to guarantee anything that any leader of the United States says if we have this kind of rogue element inside of our nation? Uh, so, on Sunday, January 8th, from 2 to 4 p.m., you can register for that on the website, sareforsenate.com. I would encourage people to do that. I would also encourage everybody to make a donation to uh, the new campaign I'm running in 2024, the seat held by Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, um, and we'd like to start the year off with a bang. So join us then. Thank you for tuning in. I hope we'll have both Roger and Fred back. Please get your Play-Doh and your pomegranates and work on this. And again, I'm offering a billion dollars to anyone who can identify two identical snowflakes. And we will see you next week.